Hi, uh, I'm Jules, uh, Jules Compaore. I'm from Burkina Faso. I'm actually the cousin of the president of Burkina Faso. Yeah, I was Well, it's kind of true because we share the same name. It's Blaise Compaore and Jules Compaore, and he is from my bigger village. So somehow we are related, but not like, you know, I would fly back home and go to him and say, well, I take the greetings from Concordia University. No, that won't happen, okay? Mm -hmm. But we are sort of related. Burkina Faso is in West Africa, for those who don't know. Actually, I always forget to kind of upload like a map of Africa and to show you where Burkina Faso is. Because being a French-speaking country and very little, lost somewhere, landlocked in West Africa, it is not much known. And I remember going to, uh, being in London, going to a travel agency and wanted to book a return flight. And I said to that lady, I want a ticket to, to work at Google. And she stopped there and looked at me and said, are you serious? I'm like, yeah. Do you mean what a Google is a place? I said, yeah. Do they have an airport? <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. The plane said lands on trees. <laughs> but this is, you know, this is to show how people, you know, sometimes don't know. So Burkina Faso is in West Africa, just above Ghana. It's a landlocked country and landlocked by Ghana, Niger, Côte d'Ivoire, Mali, uh, Benin, and Togo. And uh, the closest to the sea that Burkina Faso is, is about 600 miles. So I went to Duluth on Saturday and I was so happy to just stand there and look at, you know, the, the, what for me is a sea because you know, that lake there, Lake Superior, is like a sea for Burkina Faso. This is me and my wife. I miss her right now. Just, I wish I wasn't here. I wish I was at home. But it's okay. <laughs> These are my family, my wife and my three daughters on the top picture and my little one on the bottom picture. I have a boy, but he was nowhere to be found. So I can't. <laughs> you know, boys are always busy playing football and doing this. So I, she wasn't there. Yeah, so, yeah. This is one of the things that we do back home. I believe in youth. And I often say this, right? If you take everything out of me that is youth related, you've got nothing left. My heart and my passion is for young people. Because I see that this world, the future of this world is in the hands of young people, whatever they are. The future of any nation is in young people. So this is part of the thing that we do. The two top pictures are school that we're building. And we actually, that was a project I wanted to do about 10 years ago. But it's very hard. And like someone would put it, this school was built brick by brick. You know, from different people, some of my friends, and most of my salary, you know, would go there. And this is really what we're doing. I am a teacher myself, because I teach, I'm actually the academic dean, of our Barrel Institute, who only go to a BA and a master level. And right now we have about 300 students. We have about 230 students on the BA and about 17 on the master, master course. And we run full time studies, which is really from October to June, and we have about 80 students there. Uh, we also have very powerful um, part-time, and the part-time students are more. Just before I flew to the UK, I had 121 students in my class trying to teach them New Testament Shell. Goodness me, that was hard. Yeah. And I almost split the class because I'm like, I can't do this 100. And I've given them an essay for like 10 pages each. So I'm going back and I'm going, 
mark like a ton of, uh, of copies. But my heart really is into teaching and into school. This is why we do these books. And the, the, picture, the picture below, this one, is actually the village where I was born. I was born in the mud, hut, mud house. And to me, what God had done through me, through education, or by His grace in education, is what is leading me to believe that is something there, and I really want to provide that, you know, as far as I can for my village people. This is the same picture coming up again. And in here, we see the parents. That was actually on the 15th of July, 2013, if it was a Saturday. If it wasn't a Saturday, then it was the Saturday around that sort of date. Mm -hmm. That we had uh, our holiday, our summer break, and all the teachers were there, and the parents and the kids, you know, to receive the, you know, what they have done for the year and do some shows for the parents. It was just amazing. And uh, again, our, one, one thing about our school is that I honestly believe that education is for everyone. And if you look at here, you will see maybe 50% of these kids would be Muslim, Muslim kids. And we receive them because their parents are happy to send them to our school for education and we receive them. If you look at this man there, he's one of my, uh, my uncle, he's a Muslim. And for us, one very, very important thing that I will mention about Burkina Faso is that we are so much family focused. So much family focused that religion as it is, is not breaking that. And what I mean by that is, everyone has this religious value, but again, we value each other as individuals. So it's not a problem for me to visit Muslim people, and actually two of my brothers are Muslim, we get on well very well, and we get on very well together. It's not a problem for Muslim people to come to me. Actually, on Christmas Day, I would have at least 40 Muslims come to wish me Happy Christmas. And this is a value that so many people, not in Burkina, outside Burkina, try to knock out. But we stay together because I believe this is very, very important. So it's a Christian school, I would say, but educating absolutely everyone. And these are the kids, well dressed up, um, you know, that's the finest clothes they can get, to come there because it's a big day for them. It's a big day, they want to show the parents, they want to show the teachers, they want to show everyone that they're happy to have what they have and that they will learn as much as they can. And these are part of the, the picture taken in the, in, in the show. And these are the parents. And this man here, that you see, you, you, you notice his hat. In Burkina, if you are not a chief or a prince, you are not allowed to wear that. In fact, if you wear it and you are found guilty, it's not even the traditional people, the police will arrest you. Because we are colonized by France, so it's a, it's a democratic government but they still give value to tradition. And this is like, if the minister of, of the home secretary, whatever, goes to the village, he will pay respect to this guy. You know, this is, this is the way, because the tradition that they have found and that they get. And his, him being here, he's actually, I was, I was surprised. I didn't know he would come. He was sent by the big chief to come because in Burkina we have four kingdoms, but the Wakatubu kingdom is like in the heart of the Mosi Empire. And under him, the guy who sent this guy would be would be the Mosi Emperor or the Mosi King, and then under him would be the guy who sent this guy and this guy. So he's very kind of high run person. 
So it's a way of saying, look, you are here to help us. And we are so happy for what you're doing. And after we've been there, we want to see the chief, main guy, you, this, one of these guys, you don't shake hands. Unless he knows you. Unless he invites you. Unless he actually puts his hand up. You don't. You stay six feet, well, six meters away. You bow down. I wouldn't say worship, but you pay him honor. You know, but when we go, he will, oh, George, you're here today. So he will, he will greet you. And, and the people in the village, whoever this guy shake hand, wow, you're like, oh my goodness, how do you do that? And this is the way, it's a bit of saying what Africa is like, even now, and how it functions. Again, this is another group of kids. This is in the city. And um, a special thing about these kids are, is that we start to teach them English. It's an infant school with English impact to it. And these guys can stand up and, you know, greet to you in English, the seven days of the week are, the 12 months of the year are. And it's just fascinating because Burkina is a French-speaking country. I mean, if I was speaking in French today, goodness me, it would be 50 times easier because, yeah, but these guys, I, I did not speak a word of English till I was 15. And I know how much this opened the world to me. That's why I start to input English values in these people. Because if today you speak French and English in Africa, basically the whole Africa is open to you. Apart from Mozambique and Angola or whatever. And almost the whole world is open to you. That's why we have English input. And this is a very nice picture. <laughs> Hope you like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so tonight, I don't see clock. What time do I stop? So I make sure. Yeah. Come on. What time? It's six twenty right now. It's six twenty. Okay. I finish at seven. Is that deal? Okay, um, good versus evil, okay? I'm going to ask Valerie to read three short passages of the Bible. Because as a Christian and as a researcher, everything that I'm doing is actually taken from the Bible. So she's going to read Ephesians 6 and Revelation 12 and Galatians 5. Please. Okay. Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Yeah, I think that would do. Right. Revelation 12 verse 7. And you read to verse 12, please. Revelation 12? 12, yeah. Verse 7, okay. Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power, and the kingdom of God, and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore, rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Thank you. Galatians 5, verse 16 to 18. Mm -hmm. 
You want me to start at which yeah. verse? Yeah. So 16. 16. Okay. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you were led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Okay, that's fine. Good. Um, spiritual warfare, or let's call it good versus evil. Actually, I like that. Good versus evil. When you look at the world today, there's one thing that you cannot fail to recognize. There is good. And good is manifested in so many ways. Like today, you've been so good to me. Honestly, I'm standing here looking at you. You're quiet. You're listening or at least pretending to listen. <laughs> and you're so good. And we can define good many other ways. But also there is evil. And the question that always pops up, question that always comes is why? Sometimes not even how, but why? Because those who believe in God believe that God is good. And I say those who believe in God because we are now in a time of life, we haven't started now, where in some places God is just like a swear word. God is for those who are there, not for me. And sometimes I think about it, and I'm like, you've got to have enough courage and enough faith not to believe in God. Because everything that you will replace God with is very, very hard to define very difficult to define. And to, but today we see that but people who believe in God know that God is good. But again, they can see that there is evil. Now the question is, why? Why a good God, a beautiful world, and evil? And some people will even go, I have one of my brothers, who, uh, when he started, you know, when he went to college and to high school and started to kind of reason philosophically, he one day said to me, you know what, Jules, I believe God created the world, but I think everything is not too big for God to handle. He can't manage it anymore, and he had run and went hiding. <laughs> <laughs> so basically it's like, oh, God cannot do it anymore. It's like there are seven billion people on the planet and they are always doing things God told them not to do. So God is like, forget it, I leave you, I run away. You, you, you know, take care of yourself. To the point it's like that, but I tell you what, it happened. God is here and is in control of absolutely everything that is going on. But yet, there is evil. One of the books that helped me in that, not the whole thing, because I don't, if you find somebody who can answer this question very easily, come and tell me and I will pay to be in this lecture. But one of, one of the guys who said something which helped me in that, in Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop somewhere in South Africa. Actually, I know where he lives. I've been, not to his house, but I've been on, on the road and it's actually, in this world, there are one single road on which there are two Nobel Prize winners. And it's on that road. Because you go, there's Nelson Mandela's house there, and if you go any further, in Desmond Tutu's house. Desmond Tutu wrote a book called God Has a Dream. And he said something very little there, which I used to expand my thinking about that. He said, God took a risk in creating man in his image. 
And for me, this is enough to kind of unlock the problem of evil. God created man in his likeness, in his image. And that became God's major problem. God's major problem, why? Because he created man as resembling God with a complete free will. That's one thing. Secondly, with the potential of doing good, with the potential of doing bad. I mean, look, if God decides today to just kick the globe, who would say something? No one will. If God, honestly, I don't know if he's ever thought of it, if God decides today, he's not going to, hopefully, no, he's not, not going to, but if God decides today to do wicked things, who will stop him? Nobody. And he created a man in his likeness. So man is full with the potential of good and the potential of bad. And you would say, well, why isn't God stopping him? Hello, he created a completely free man. And someone said something which I really like. Someone said, God will never kidnap anybody to heaven. And what he means is, he has his arms open, wants everyone to come, but whoever rejects him is not going to go after him. Why? He is free. And by creating a free man, a free-willed man, man do whatever he wants. And sometimes, being from Africa, from West Africa, you must have, you know, known what we as West Africans have lived in the last couple of years. Um, right now, in Mali, which is next to Burkina, there's a big thing going on. It's kind of subsidized now, it's kind of cooled down now. But about a year ago, my goodness, it was, it was bad. To the point, in Burkina, we had, in one week, 40,000 refugees come to the border of Burkina Faso. And the government even had to stop the provision that they give to the schools for the canteen and take care to the refugees. And I think the Assumption of God Church was the first to meet these refugees and I think give them like eight ton of rice and whatever. You know. But this is, this is, this is, people can say it is God. No, it's not God. It is man. It's man's doing it. Before Maldi, we had Cote d'Ivoire. Cote d'Ivoire was a different situation. Again, political. And one thing that happened in Cote d'Ivoire, which I don't know if you, you know, if that was in the movie, it would be 18. I'm going to tell you. So get ready. If it's in the movie, it won't be PG, it won't be 12, it won't be 15, but actually it won't even be 18, it will be like 21. But this is something that happened, and someone was there told me. Now there was one guy and his family, and the rebels just went in. And I say rebels, because I wouldn't say which party, even though I kind of know. They went in. And they shot the dad dead. And they said to the mom, I want you to put a pan, a cooking thing on the stove, and take his, uh, what, what is it? I forgot that word in English. Take one of the organs inside him and fry and eat your children. And they meant it. That's I'm telling you how wicked man can be. And the woman said, no, I can't do that. And she said, well, they said, look, we will, you will be next. The only way you will get away is if you do that. Open him, take his, uh, I don't know what it is. 
forgot the word, the word I remember the name of telling you. Take that, fry on that pan, and you eat. And the first daughter of that family stepped up and said, Mom, look, there's a situation here. Dad's dead, okay? Whatever we do to him, nothing. He can't feel it. Why, if you don't want to do it, I will do it to save our lives. She got everything ready. She went in and she told these guys, I'll bring you a good knife. And by then, they have, they have lowered their weapons. And the girl went inside. And by the time they know, she brought her a Kalashnikov and started to fire in the wrong way. If she had not been that wicked clever, they would all die. Because whatever happened, they were going to be killed anyway. And this is to tell you how much human being can be wicked. Very, very easily, we can blame God on things like that. Okay? I know God could stop it. Yeah, but he decided not to. Because he knows that in every human being's heart, there is good, there is the awareness of good and evil. And God, whichever religion you are from, God will tell you, do good. And if you start to do bad, God's watching. He created you in his image. And there's one day you will meet. It's like I told this young man in Oxford not a long time ago. He started to argue with me that he doesn't believe in God. When I told him I believe in God, he's like, What? You believe in God? And I'm like, yeah. You really mean it. You are one of these guys. These hippie sort of guys who who would think that there is a God. And I'm like, yeah. And we start talking. And I then I said to him, look, it is one thing. You're British. I'm African. Okay? When it comes to health and safety in Africa, we really, really don't know it much. We don't know health and safety regulations that much. You British, you know it. Because you go to a supermarket and you buy a knife, it will have on a tag, be careful, sharp knife can cut you. You know, you go and buy coffee, you'll be like, be careful, or drink. <laughs> Let it cool before you sit. This is how common sense has just jumped out of the window and buried by the British sort of thinking. Okay, so you are a British man, you know health and safety. I'm gonna kind of give you a health and safety help here. You keep on not believing in God, no problem. I will keep on believing in God. One day you and I will die. When we die, now the thing begins. If I find that God is not there, I'll lose absolutely nothing. I have just spent all my life believing in something who doesn't exist. So what? But now you, my friend, if you die and you find that God is there, whoops, it's too late. So you better think about that now. You better think about how when you die and you find God, what are you going to do? So it's not about God wanting to force us. He is completely letting us go free. But with in us, even those who don't believe in him, a sense of knowing that good is there and evil is there. And actually those who will obey God will find out that there is good, more good in their lives than evil. Now, my research is about spiritual warfare. Spiritual warfare, again, is for me good versus evil. And spiritual warfare was just seen in three small dimensions. It still is, but it's kind of developed over the years. And these three dimensions is only flesh, world, and devil, in the Christian perspective. And flesh, 
basically, it's like everything that is in the me without any other outside intervention that is making me want to choose wicked. Everyone has that potential. Everyone has a little pride in him. Everyone has something in him that's kind of want to push him sometimes to do the wrong thing. And it is within me. And by the way, this is the heart of the problem. Because unless you let that desire to do bad things take over in your life, there is no evil. You know, very recently there are two British women who went to Peru and they were arrested because they have found, I need to quote that right, I cannot remember the figure, they have found maybe about 10,000 pounds worth of cocaine in their languages. And their argument was that they were forced to carry it. Well, this is a process that is going on. They were forced to carry it. That can be true. What I'm saying here is that there are times when you will be forced to do evil. That's one thing. There are times when you will be brainwashed to the point that evil is no longer evil. And for me, this is the maximum of evil. If someone can convince someone that good is wrong and wrong is good, that's it. But still, you as an individual, you have to fight about it. So within me, there is a war which we, which me, and many people among us call spiritual warfare. Because the minute you decide to follow God, you decide to follow Jesus, there is something. We believe that the minute you decide to follow Jesus, there is like you are leaving one kingdom for another. And the kingdom you are leaving do not like it. And your flesh is already there. Because you used to do things that now you can no longer do. But it doesn't mean you killed it. It is there in you. And uh, in Christian circles, the way I can put this is, you know Jesus went on the cross. They did not crucify him to kill him. The cross wasn't for killing, just killing for a very, very, very slow and painful death. And Paul speaks that we are crucified. As Christians, we should be crucified with Christ. Now the problem is, some Christians think that because they are crucified with Christ, they have died. No, you have not been decapitated with Christ. Because if they chop your head off, that's it. You've been crucified. It means your flesh still have a life going on. It is painful. It is a fight. And Paul paints it clear in Romans when he says, I want to do good, but I can't do good. I know I don't want to do bad, but this is what is pulling me. I can't help it. Well, now, again, this is a term that many people use. I did this because I can't help it. And the more people cannot help certain things, society ends up looking at that thing and saying, well, if they can't help it, then it is why. But I leave it there. Again, this is, this is, this is us. There is something in me. But the minute... For me, the minute we commit ourselves to Christ and live according to the Spirit, like she says, as she read, then something would happen. Now I'm going to move on to give you some few definitions of spiritual warfare. When I, but when I started to do this, this research, I didn't know that there are so many books written on that. And one author 
says that between 1960 and 1986, a total number of 509 different titles were written on spiritual warfare. And 80% of that number was written between the year 1985 and 1986. 1985 and 1986. So it's a massive, massive, massive field. And I didn't know that. Now that I'm engaged in it, I got to read them. And right now, I think I must have covered about 100 books about this topic. There are, many, um, there are various views and definitions about spiritual warfare, and each according to church tradition, the define and belongs. Some scholars define spiritual warfare as a multi-level conflict between good and evil. Basically, there is good, which is always ascribed to God, and there is bad, which we know it is the evil one. Well, now some people want to say that evil also comes from God and leave them with the argument. But for me, God is good. But he created man. And by the way, I need to say that before I forget. One illustration about that which I really like, it happens in Africa, you may not have a clue. But I would say anyway. There's two people who went to a market and then a, a fight broke. You know, in Africa, every three days, some area, every seven days, there's a market where everyone comes and, you know, they sell these things, they do what they want to do. And the war, two people can start fighting. And it was between A and B. And A was strong enough and he beat B correctly. I don't know if it's because it's B that he got bitten, but, but whatever. So B lost the fight. And he knows that there's no way he's going to win the fight with A. So what did B do? B left for a moment when A wasn't at home. And B went to A's house and found his wife and children and beat them properly. So he kind of just went there and abused them. And later, A saw B and said to him, what have you just done to my family? And B said, look, let's put it this way. There is no way I will win a fight. Whenever you touch me, I will get your family. Because I can, I can win them. And that's the end of it. So for me, this is a kind of very easy way to put it. God created man in his image. But before he created man, like we read in Revelation, that Satan was cast down to earth. Satan was there when God was creating man. And Satan could be thinking, hang on a minute. Why did he not create me like him? And he created this poor person, this poor human being like him. Let him do it. I can't win with God. But I will give so much of the hard time to these humans that he has created. It may not make sense to you, but this is how I easily understand it. And one scholar, Fape from Nigeria, he put it this way. The war really isn't between man and Satan. The war is between God and Satan. But human man is to punch back. For, so this is how spiritual warfare is defined. And some, spirit, some scholars will define spiritual warfare as an invisible battle in the spiritual realm involving power confrontation between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of darkness. Well, again, I need to go back to Africa a little bit because um, in here, we're not talking about cosmology. We're not talking about different views of what the world is made of. Well, like I said, in, in the Western world, some people, there is humans, and there is maybe God, but there is nothing in the middle. There's nothing in the middle. There isn't, there is nothing like, you know, a spirit. There is nothing like demons. 
And since I started to read this, I have seen both poles. I've seen people who will go far there and say, look, there isn't a spirit. There isn't Satan. And Bultmann, he's one of the you know, fine scholars, you've heard of him, actually said, look, there isn't such thing as angels and demons. And he puts it this way. He said, you cannot, um, you cannot turn the mobile phone. This is, he, if he was here today talking. You cannot turn the mobile phone and turn on a laptop and still think, and use the internet, and still think that there is such thing as a demon. Well, Mr. Bulletman, you're wrong, I think. Now he knows because he's dead. I'm sure now he knows, but it's too late. So you will see people who will go far there and say, look, there isn't something like this. There is nothing. There isn't Satan. There isn't demons. It's all new age sort of thing. And I also saw people who will go far there who will see a demon under every bush. And for me, I just want to kind of bring them two together and stay in the middle. I don't, I'm not on Bultman's side, and I'm also not on the side where people see demons and everything. But I believe that there is something going on. And my own experience in Africa, again, when you say things like that, it is hard to kind of academically evaluate. But I tell you what, you have seen something, and I wasn't crazy, I wasn't drunk or whatever, and I've seen something, you can make of it what you want. But this is, I've seen it, that's it. On the 2nd of January, 1998, me and my friend Augustine went to Kutu. On our way back, our motorbike kept breaking, breaking, breaking. So by the time we were closer to Wagadu, we were in a place called Nyimdi. When you come to Bukina, I'll take you there. And at Nyimdi, it was about 1 o'clock in the morning. A very moon, full moon. You know, in Africa, it's not green. There are not many trees, so you can see like almost half a mile around you. And right in the middle of the road, as we were riding this little Yamaha, we saw the big, big, big bull standing right in front. Well, if I was the only one to see it, I would be like, yeah, Jules, I think you, you know, there's something not going right there. But my friend Augustine also saw it. Actually, he's the one who saw it first, because he was riding. And before I told him, Augustine, be careful, there's a bull in front of you. He said, yeah, I see it. I see the animal. And I said to him, don't, don't go in front, go behind that beast. And we just went around there, and a few meters later, I turned, we all turned, we stopped, and that animal was nowhere to find. Well, yeah, think about it. <laughs> and, and there are so many things like that. And also, what is bringing people to church in Africa is part of that sort of going on. Because people believe in a world full of spirits. Basically, the Morsi people, because now I have to kind of narrow it, because my research is among the Morsi people. But you can actually widen it to so many people. The Morsi people believe that there is a creator God who created everything. But he's so far remote that you cannot have access to him. So he created like a pantheon of gods, small gods, like the river god, the tree god, the mountain god, the wind god. And, and this is like a powerful order where people, through certain sacrifices and uh, regulations, can go and get power. And this is where the whole idea of witchcraft, of sorcery, of Grigri, of uh, charms, of uh, uh, casting spells, and all this come from. It is something that people are living. This is their life before Christianity. Christianity have not 
been to Burkina Faso before 1900. Because the Roman Catholic, the white fathers, brought the Roman Catholic Church in Burkina Faso up to in 1900, until the 3rd of January, 1900. And it was in 1921 that the Evangelical Church started to come. Before that, Islam was in Burkina in the 1500. So now, even that, even now, Burkina is still traditional religion people there and still practicing there. And for them, this God who is powerful, who can do everything, is a far away. He is good, but he is a far. He created a pantheon of God who can be as good as bad, who can heal, who can kill, who can destroy, who can bring to life. Again, in their context, there is good versus evil. Even in that little worldview. Forget about God. In their little worldview, they believe that they are good spirit and that they are bad spirit. And that good spirit and bad spirit are fighting each other. So if someone is not happy with me and he casts a spell on me, He's kind of engaging the bad spirit to come and attack me. Well, if I go, I need to find a more powerful spirit to counterattack this hell. And this is the way they live. Then the gospel message comes and says, Look, there is a good news. You have been looking for God, the big God who created everything whom you think you could not have access to, whom you did not know that you will actually have a relationship with, this gospel message is bringing you the opportunity to meet this God. Well, these guys are not going to take it immediately. They're going to test it. They're going to try it. We have seen villages where we have sent a pastor in the village. And the first three months, he will not get a convert. But what he will find is, he will find in this compound a little hole that was dug. And when he opens it, he will see some stuff, some grigri, some magic stuff. And this is the village people testing the pastor, testing him to see, look, if he says, his God is powerful, let him feel that. And I tell you what, they will try that and they will fail. And they will come to you and they say, how many men? I was believing that I was powerful. Do not forget everything has, is related to power. I was believing that I've got it. You now tell me how I failed on you. How I failed to do wrong to you. And this is how the gospel is moving in Africa. It is what Peter Wagner calls power and counter. They believe in power. The gospel is the demonstration of power. And when these come together, something happens. And also, the way the Christian have won if those who have won the battle inside them the first battle we spoke about this is also a very powerful testimony and we actually tell a story about one person who went in the village and people hated him no one in the village liked him so he had his beans in his field and well, the African beans you will see there was a time when it will come with flowers ready to kind of, you know, yield fruit. And this guy in the village just decided that at that very time, he will go to the pastor's field. He will uproot all the beans and give it to his donkey or his animals. And the pastor noticed that. So one day, the pastor was deciding, I really want to see who does that. 
So he found, I figure out a time. And he went, and the guy was doing it. And he said, hello, oh, how are you doing? You're working here. And he said, yeah, I'll give you a hand. And the person himself started to uproot the things and folding it and giving it to the guy. And he stopped. This guy stopped and said, Pastor, look, this is more powerful than I can think. I'm going to follow your God. Because no one in our tradition, no one in human life will do that by his power. You must have a certain power that is giving you to do this. Otherwise, the first thing, you, if you had hit me dead here, in the village, people would say you're right. So again, winning this battle within us, which the different struggles that we have in life, and showing to people, and the love that we can demonstrate to people is a way of saying, look, there is evil, but you don't have to act according to evil. Because there is power within us that can lead us to do what is good. There is power within us that our God can yield so that we win all the battles. Good versus evil, I know. I've got like one minute left, if not. Or oh, one minute thirty-four seconds. <laughs> I think I'll wrap up now. I mean, like I said, um, I could talk about this forever. But I'm thinking the way I presented it is the way I felt, you know, kind of, not compelled, but I felt appropriate to present. There really, really is good in this world. And there really, really is evil in this world. Man is in the center of both. We are subject to good, subject to evil. Every evil that is happening in the world right now don't have to happen. No. If man win this first battle, when you say, yeah, what about typhoons? What about earthquakes? What about you know, natural disaster. Well, we cannot answer that. The only answer we can bring to that is again, God created, if you go back to Genesis, you will see that God actually created the world and given it to man and said, take care of it. You know our mandate? He didn't. He didn't take a good care of the planet. What can God do? God is like, well, I created that beautiful thing for you. I'm not there. This is my timer asking me to show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and God is saying, well, I created this beautiful thing for you. I don't live there. Hello. Hello, mankind. I don't live on earth. You take care of the planet. You will get good results. You go on and do things. Well, what can I do? I can only watch you. I can only intervene. I can only help you. I can only rescue you. But it is your responsibility. So good is my responsibility. Evil is my responsibility. And one pastor in my country went to big market to evangelize. And he started by saying this. Since I was born, I have never done wrong to anybody. And people are like, what? And he says, since I was born, I have never done any good to anybody. It's like people now got really confused. And he says, and you know what? All the good that I have done, done against me. All the evil that I have done, I have done against me. 
on this note, I will say, good is in us. Evil is in us. Let's choose one. Thank you very much for listening.